Okay, so we're returning here, and I in the previous slide I had two conversion factors written out. I went from atoms to moles, and then from moles to atoms. And so I calculated that out, and when I do all my math, I get something like 33.9. And then since I'm subtracting 22 minus 23, I get times 10 to the negative first. Okay, so this is um, you know a, a pretty basic conversion here. If I move my decimal to the left, making my coefficient smaller by one power of ten. I've got to make this negative zero a one or negative one a zero, excuse me. And so it's really just going to end up as three point three nine grams of zinc. Okay, so you want to kind of think about this answer. This is by far much, much less than the sixty five point four grams per mole for one mole of zinc. And this right here is not times 10 to the 23rd as in Avogadro's number, it's less. So this answer would, it would agree. So always think about your answers so you don't make silly mistakes. So now we're going on to, I think this is chapter 4 when we talk about the electromagnetic spectrum, frequency, wavelength, and energy of photons. And so in this particular problem, and many people had problems with this on their chapter test, you first have to figure out what type of problem it is. And so since we're talking about frequency and we're talking about wavelength here, what that means then is that we are talking about uh, the fact that if you multiply the frequency and the wavelength of radiation together, you're going to get something that's called the speed of light. So you can immediately see, looking at those that we have, C, the speed of light, equals lambda, which is the wavelength, times the frequency, which is nu. Okay, so that's your basic equation. Now, we know that we're solving for wavelengths, so if you want to rearrange it right now, it's going to be lambda equals the speed of light over nu. And so our list, of course, we have to figure out what this hertz thing is, and, and that is frequency. And so hertz uh, 4.5 times 10 to the 15th hertz. Now, please recall that when you're plugging hertz in, it's really more helpful to plug in one over a second because hertz is waves per second, the number of waves that pass a given point within one second. Okay, and you need to know the speed of light is 3.00 times 10 to the eighth meters per second. Okay, so if we go back here and we look at our rearranged equation, we're going to plug into this. Now you don't go back and plug into this initial basic equation. You always plug in to rearrange. So our wavelength is going to be equal to 3.00 times 10 to the eighth meters. And the way I do this is per second. So these two units go together. All right, and then on the bottom I'm going to put 4. 5 times 10 to the 15th. Now, this is going to be waves per second, but since this is a denominator, I'm going to flip that waves per second or one per second. Now, when you see that, you should be able to cross out seconds, and you're left with meters, which is a length, so that would be the right unit. All right, so we're going to take 3, and we're going to divide it by 4.5, so it's going to be 0.6 repeating. Yeah, so it's going to be point. 6, 7, and we're only going to use two significant figures here. Uh, we're going to use two because our frequency only has two, even though the speed of light has three. So it's going to be 0.67. Now, we have to think about this. 8 minus 15 means we have times 10 to the negative 7th. And, of course, that's going to be meters, but then we have to convert. So it's 6.7. Seven. This became larger by power of 10. Our exponent becomes smaller. Don't go backwards. And your unit is going to be meters. Okay. Now I think there was something in there about this um, wavelength and is it going to have more energy or less energy than ultraviolet light. Uh, it depends what you look at. It's, it's actually, it could be right within the ultraviolet light wavelength or it could be on um, just the slightly more energetic side of that. So I kind of called it too close. I should have gone with infrared. Okay. So um, as long as you know that the shorter the wavelength or the higher the frequency, the more energy you have, uh, that's the main deal. Okay. So uh, now again in chapter four, Four, we are talking about um, energy here, talking about the electromagnetic spectrum. And so we're talking about a photon of energy. 
And here is the energy that that photon carries. So again, we're going to be solving for frequency. Well, as soon as you see joules, you know it's energy. All right, so you should say, ah, yeah, I got that one. The energy of a photon is equal to this number here, which is a constant, Planck's constant, times the frequency of that particular photon. Now, if we're going to be solving for frequency, it's frequency equals the energy of the joule over Planck's constant. Okay, so energy, remember, joules is energy. Energy equals 8.90 times 10 to the negative ninth joules. And we need to know one more thing, and that would be H. And you can use 6.63, you can use 6.626, it doesn't matter, times 10 to the negative 34th, and that's joule seconds. All right, so essentially, just to save a little bit of time in this podcast, I've laid this out so that it's going to be set up just like the equation. So I'm just going to kind of fudge it here to save time. And here's my equation. So uh, I'm going to divide 8.9 by 6.63. And I'm going to go with three sig figs here. So I get 1.34 it looks like. Now here's the part where a lot of people really messed up. So take your time. Negative 9 minus negative 34. Well, that's the same thing, folks, as negative 9 plus 34. And the way I figure that out is I just take 34 and I subtract off 9, and then I call it a negative number. Okay? So if you take 34 and you subtract off 9, you get 25. So this is going to be a negative 25, I think. I hope. Okay? So, um, oops, that's wrong. I should have a positive 25. Bad, bad, bad. Okay, so it's plus. Your 34 is actually going to be positive, so it's going to give you a positive 25. I apologize. So now when you look at your units, you go back here and you cancel your units. Bam, bam. Okay, what you have to be aware of is that you're going to end up with something that looks like this, waves per second. Well, don't use that. You're going to use the real unit, which is hertz. Okay, this does not need to be adjusted because we have a number that's between 9 and 9.9 .9 repeating for a coefficient, so we're good to go. And again, it's negative 9 minus negative 34, which is negative 9 plus 34. Okay, so that's going to give us 25, positive 25. Okay, the electron configuration for zirconium. All right, zirconium is going to be a d-block metal. And so what we're going to have to remember, um, first of all, is we've got to find um, a atomic number for that. So zirconium actually has an atomic number of 40. Okay, so we're going to put up here Z. Z equals 40 for the atomic number of zirconium. Okay, now if I look at the periodic table, I'm going to see zirconium is in the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5th series Okay, but listen, it's in the D block, so I'm going to knock off one series number, so it's going to be in the 4D row, and it's next to yttrium before niobium, so it's going to end in 4D2. But remember, it's going to be in the fifth period, and it's going to be in the fourth group. Okay, so that's just a little pre-planning. I'm going to have 1S2, 2S2. 2p6. I go to the third series, 3s2, across to 3p6. I go to 4s2, and then I drop down a principal quantum number to the 3d sublevel. And at that point, I have to count up how many electrons I have there. Whoops, I'm on the wrong guy. I'm a row ahead, so I got 10 electrons there. And then I'm going to keep going 4p6. Okay, so I've got 4s2, 3d10, 4p6 in the fourth series, and then what I'm going to do is continue in the fifth series with 5s2, and then I'm going to drop down to 4d, and now there comes my 2. Okay, now remember, if I were doing orbital notation, for a d sublevel, I would have 5 orbitals, and remember, these two electrons here that you see are going to be put into different 
orbitals, and that's Hund's rule. So think of those things as you're going through. Now is the orbital diagram, and uh, I gave you a hint here. It's lines and arrows. And if you ever get in a situation where you don't know, then just ask. Okay, so for iron, Z equals, and it's going to be in that uh, 3D row. So for iron, your Z is going to be equal to 26. Okay, so if you look at the periodic table, it's in the fourth series. So you're going to have 4s2 preceding the 3d, and you're going to have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. It's going to have a 3d6 ending. Okay, so I'm, I'm doing this so I know what to draw. And I just double check right now to make sure that I have the right um, atomic numbers. So 1s, I have one orbital in my 1s sublevel, two electrons. 2s, same thing, it's still an s sublevel. 2p. Okay, now remember our filling order. Again, this is Hund's rule. These electrons go to separate orbitals within the same sublevel before they double up. Okay, so here's 3s. One electron up, one down, 3p. You always draw all three sublevels in a p sublevel, even if they don't fill. And it's up, 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 down, down, down. After 3p, you're going to go to 4s. So we have another s sublevel. And then we go to 3d. And we have five orbitals in the 3d sublevel. So it's going to go like this 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. Okay. Now remember the order in which these fill is according to more and more energy as we keep going into different sublevels. That's um, going to be the off-ball principle. And that's something you need to be aware of for your exam. And then don't forget, we don't have any two of these arrows with the same direction in the same orbital within a sublevel. Um, if so, that would be violating um, the Pauli exclusion principle. So I told you to keep those in mind. Okay, noble gas configuration for polonium. So polonium symbol is PO, and it's in group 16, way the heck down there. Now remember, if something's in group 16, uh, it's going to have six valence electrons. Okay, so start thinking about that a little bit, but we don't have eight valence electrons, so we need to back up to the beginning of that series and then to the end of the previous series where we see the noble gas, um, or the, yeah, the noble gas um, xenon, okay, so then we put xenon in parentheses, or not parentheses, but brackets, and you guys know that when you see these square brackets, and you see a uh, noble gas inside, what that means is you have the electron configuration of xenon, every single one of your electrons, and I think it's uh, 54 electrons, are accounted for. And then you pick up at the beginning of the next series where cesium begins. So cesium is in the one, two, three, four, five, sixth series. So you pick up with a 6s2. Now on your test, many of you forgot this next sublevel. Remember, after that 6s2, barium, uh, you're going to enter, enter the lanthanide series. And when you do that, you have to drop down to the 4f sublevel to fill it. And when you're done with that, then you can pop back up to the 5d sublevel. And then since polonium is in the p block, we're again back to the 6th series, and it's going to be p, and it's going to be the fourth column over. Okay? So you have xenons, 54 electrons. Then you have 2, 16, 26, 30 more. And we sure hope that polonium's atomic number is going to be 84. Okay, and yes it is. Okay. All right, in the home stretch now, and I do have a specific heat problem that I want to add, and I'm going to have you add that to the back. I'll get to that in a little bit. At any rate, we're going to do noble, uh, excuse me, Lewis dot structures for all of these. Now, the first thing we want to do is we want to determine what group these are in. So bromine is in 17, rubidium is in group 1, aluminum is in group 13, sulfur is in group 16, germanium is in group 14, and helium is in group 18. But remember, it only has two electrons, so it can't have an octet.